Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Authentic Identity question mark panel uh, discussion. So I just wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are gathering here today on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for di a diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. I'm Dr. Risa Klein, and I am the Senior Officer of Major Initiatives in the Office of the Vice President of the Vice President Research and Innovation at the University of Alberta, and as, as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies. And I'm really excited to be here today for this discussion on artificial intelligence and identity with experts from the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta. So this morning's panel discussion will focus on what it means to be a human in the age of artificial intelligence and the implications of AI for personal, collective, and cultural identities. The impacts of AI on who we are and who we can become are far reaching, touching on many areas of human experience, including precision health diagnostics and treatment, automated legal reasoning, military uses, financial forecasting and risk assessment, criminal sentencing, and automated transportation, to name a few. As AI is becoming more ubiquitous and integrated into our lives, there are new sets of relations, connections, and interactions that can often blur the line between human and machines in ways that have implications for human identity. We often think of artificial intelligence only in technological terms, but AI development, use, and application cannot be separated from the social contexts in which they occur. The many influences that shape and delimit AI have consequences for human lives, including the production and construction of individual and collective identities. As many studies have pointed out, artificial intelligence can be subject to racial and gender bias, where predictive systems perpetuate societal and historical injustices, and which can have serious consequences. The ethical implications of AI are among the most urgent issues facing us today, and as such, must be central to conversations about AI development and application, which is why today's discussion is so important. So before we jump into the questions, I thought we, could, we would take a moment to do some introductions from our panelists. So we'll start with Dr. Julie Rack. Hey, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here, and I'm pretty sure that not all of you remember the dial phone, but I do. Yeah, mm, that's how old I get to be. I've been at the University of Alberta since the 90s. I am an HM Tory chair and also fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and I'm a professor in English and Film Studies. My specialty is theories of identity and how we live our lives in the everyday sense. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Marilyn Oliver. I'm an associate professor in art and design. I teach in printmaking and media arts. I'm going to be speaking today more as an artist who works with data and who's been thinking about artificial intelligence for, and how we're becoming datafied for about 20 years. So I'm still thinking through Hans Moravec's um, proposition that we need to, in order to survive, we need to download our consciousness into the datascape. And I still find that I'm thinking about these questions and challenging them now in my artworks. Hi. I'm. I'm Nicole Denier. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Alberta. Uh, I'm a sociologist of work and labor markets. I'm also a social demographer, so my main interest is in understanding and modeling human behavior, especially as it tains, pertains to, to work and labor. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Evans. I am an assistant lecturer in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Alberta. I teach primarily in media arts. And uh, I'm also an artist, and my work deals extensively with uh, questions of user data, uh, how it's collected, uh, the ethics around its deployment and use, and some of the generative possibilities of using it to create works algorithmically. Thank you, everyone. OK, so our first question is, how does the integration of AI technology into everyday life challenge our traditional notions of identity and self-expression? Such easy questions. Uh, what? Soft love. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to start by saying that one of the things I think about 
And this makes land acknowledgements real, because the Inuit are always in them, but the only reason why Inuit were here is because they were made to come here. Through a new technology in the 1950s, the X-ray machine to detect TB. And so they were brought here against their will. I think it's really important to say that. But the other thing is, I've worked with Minnie Alda Freeman, who's the first Inuk female memoirist in the world. So she wrote her life story and published it, one of the first. And she said something about learning how to work with machines. She said, we became automated by the machines we worked with. And I really, Minnie has a very interesting relationship to machines. So she thinks they're like animals, basically. I've asked her about this. So it's like, is it going to eat me, you know? Is it going to, is, can, I, can I control it? Can I work with it? What does it want from me? What do I need from it? That, those are the questions she asks. So like, just like a polar bear or a walrus, a washing machine is the same to her. And in some ways, this is how we should start talking about AI. Are we going to become automated by the machines we work with? Or is there another way that we have an interaction with AI? So I'd, I would just like to say that and see what you all think about it. Um, I was going to talk, uh, respond to this question um, by describing quite a recent artwork that I've made called my, I made two artworks, one called My Data Body, another one called Your Data Body. Because it seemed to me that okay, we know we're in a time of AI and that we are generating a lot of data for AI, but what is that data? How do we know it? How do we see it? How do then can we be responsible for it or try to manipulate it? Um, and so the artwork is it's a virtual reality artwork and there's an MRI scan that holds lots of other kind of data. So there's social media data, banking data, social security data, that's in it. And then when you put the VR headset on, you can kind of dissect this body um, and pull it apart in a way to try and understand it. And I kind of feel that's the question here about identity is that we, we kind of think identity as being who we are as an embodied person, but now, who we are is so dispersed and belongs to other corporations. That data is held in other places. And what we need to work towards is trying to find a way to understand our identities and how they intersect with others and who has ownership of them. Um, it's a very big, complex question. So this shifting of what identity is and how much agency we have over it is really changing. It definitely brings up large questions around privacy and surveillance as well through that. Um, absolutely, through that lens, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so I, I envision this mainly thinking about work. You know, I'm obsessed with work in labor markets. So what does work do for I, our identities and what does AI change about work that appends our identities? I mean, I think as a starting point, all work is relational, all work uh, is involved with technologies, and it is also, for many of us, our, our sort of primary identity. We get up every day, if, if we're lucky in our society, and go to work. Uh, we support ourselves through a job. Uh, we identify ourselves to others uh, through what we do. It's an expression of our moral worth. It's uh, our meaning in relation to family. And so like, if AI comes in, what is it going to do to our work identities? Is this really fundamental question. And of course, it's a fundamental question because a lot of the discussion about AI is about the potential for technological displacement, right? Are we going to invent technologies or machines or automate systems that traditionally were thought of as, as these well-held human identities and, and relationships? Um, and for a long time, uh, this happened mainly to manufacturing workers, right? Through the 80s and 90s, you see technological displacement um, through precision robotics and, and offshoring. Um, and now I think there's this question, okay, it's, it's also going to impact uh, professional workers, people who control abstract knowledge, who were traditionally protected by that. So, I, I mean, my stock feeling about this, or really my expert opinion on this, is that it's going to depend on how organizations, employers, uh, governments implement a AIs, in, in plural, because these systems are, are highly differentiated. Um, but it's clearly going to, to impact identities in, in relation to work. And I'll also just say something, because the audience doesn't know this. Um, for We were members of a book club. And so this conversation uh, is kind of funny, because uh, we all have these perspectives. And, and it's coming out again and again. So if, if you see that in us kind of laughing or nodding to it, it's because we have this uh, long-standing interaction. <laughs> it was an AI book club. You should start your own AI book club, just saying. 
Well, I guess um, I think I agree a lot with uh, many of Nicole's points here, but I guess the fundamental question for me with all of these questions is what are we talking about when we say AI? You know, it's not a well-defined term, and it's used primarily, at least as I've experienced it over the last decade or so, as a marketing term, as a way to generate hype. Uh, and so when we talk about how is AI going to affect certain kinds of identities or certain kinds of labor or things like that, we kind of have to connect that to a, a larger question about, say, automation that's been going on even since the Industrial Revolution, that kind of thing. And it's only the, the shift in the term that we're using to market the technology that's really the hard cutoff point between what we're talking about now and what people were concerned about in the 1850s, 1860s, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, I guess, I guess I'm left with more questions than answers to the questions because I don't think the term AI is particularly well defined and specificity of definition matters, particularly as we're talking about tools that are active and being deployed now. Thank you all. Would any of you like to respond to one another? I could ask you then, if, what do you think AI is about? Because that's a good question. Um, and I think it's one we can proceed from. And you can also ask, does AI have consciousness or should it? So I think I'm with uh, the kind of Georgetown Law stance on that. There was a, an editorial that came out from them a little while ago where they were strongly against even using the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning because they thought they were um, kind of fundamentally antithetical to what the tools were actually doing. Um, and I think that's something that's been echoed in sentiment, if not directly, um, by people like Emily Bender, like Tim Nickabru, like Margaret Mitchell, who are really calling for a, a critical analysis of how these tools actually work, or a, or a greater public understanding of how these tools actually work and what it is that they're doing. Um, like Emily Bender usually puts it quite takes kind of the, the very anti-romantic stance that it's a pile of linear algebra that's fundamentally deterministic in what it's doing. Obviously, that's a big oversimplification, but um, I think it's, it's kind of important to start at the ground level of understanding what the tools are doing. So like we should call it dynamic machines or, or interactive machine learning or something? Like I'm wondering what that, if calling it something else will change what we think. I don't know, I don't think I'm embedded enough in CS to be able to really give, um, like the, the, when I'm looking at, like let's just take some contemporary examples of um, generative systems that we're looking at, like text generation or image generation, those kinds of things. Where I'm locating those mentally when I'm thinking about these tools is in the history of uh, things like algorithmic art making where the system is kind of a matrix that puts constraints on a possibility space and that takes in some input and gives us some output according to a set of deterministic rules. There can be randomness involved, et cetera, but it's a deterministic system. Okay, we'll move on to question two now. So how can AI technology help us better understand our cultural identities and shared histories? You can go in any order. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is a problematic question. Um, but they, again, I'm gonna put forward some artworks and artists who actually are using this in a really good way. Um, so we, we've heard a lot about very large data sets where we don't know what's in them, the people that whose images are part of them and information are part of them weren't aware that they were part of them and they're being used without their consent. But artists such as Rashid Newsom and Stephanie Dinkins, they're really pro putting forward, um, making a small data set, a very carefully crafted data set in order to create an artwork. So for example, Rashid Newsom, he's made this work called Being, which is an app, and it's meant to be like um, a mental health aid, a virtual assistant to help black people deal with um, constant racist aggression. And so it's made for, with a very small data set and for a very small community. So there's a really great example of it being used well. In the same way, uh, Stephanie Dinkins piece called um, Not the Only One uh, is based on the oral histories of three women in one family. 
And so then AI is being trained to, to maintain oral histories of a family. So here we see really beautiful examples of how it can be used in a very positive ways to preserve a cultural history. Yeah. Wow. Those are amazing, pro sound like amazing projects. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think maybe I'll leave it to others to maybe point out some of the other problematics about that. Maybe just before I move on, I will also just mention OCAP. I don't know if we, um, so this is um, an indigenous company, uh, organization, and what they do is they fight to keep their data within their communities. Um, and that's another really great example. So that data collected by indigenous communities belongs to the community, and it is the community that decides how their data can be used. So we have fabulous examples of how this can be used in a really positive way. The dangers are maybe when then this date, we don't know who the data belongs to, when we put data out there, who's using it and why they're using it. And we know that often it's used, being used for capitalistic or kind of uh, controlling motiv motivations. And what selves are being expected of us? So to me, like I think about somebody like John Cheney Lippold, right? He wrote a book called You Are Data. And it was, and where he says an algorithmic self gets built by these big data sets that is supposed to be you, but it's not really you. And then you turn into the thing it expects you to be, right? And that to me is an ethical problem. Why would you need AI to collect oral history when people can do that? Why would you need that? You need AI to do all sorts of things, right? But maybe not that. Like, I'm kind of wondering if what that project says about that. And I think that's reminding me a little bit of some work that's been done by people like um, Morgan Klaus Schuerman and uh, Os Keys on how, I guess, for, for systems that categorize data, for systems that classify things, um, both of those researchers have been involved in work that dissects the classification systems. What kind of boxes are we putting it, people into? And uh, how, is, how does that actually function? Um, because yeah, it's, it's something that's sometimes like arbitrary or based on a priori assumption or doesn't have a whole lot of uh, critical reflection. Um, Oskies in particular has done a lot of work with um, automated uh, gender recognition and looking at, well, how is that framed? Is it a binary classifier? Is it a zero to one variable? What And who does that exclude when you carve your boxes up in this way? Who can those systems not serve inherently by virtue of how they're classifying things? Yeah. I think it's also interesting. So I, I work with large government data, like administrative data or censuses, which are obviously part of our collective understanding of ourselves, right? We analyze the census to understand what the population is doing, where people live. But the fundamental expectation, you know, as you're talking about this in the census is that you are counting individual people and those people have rights uh, enshrined through things like the Statistics Act in Canada that protect privacy um, and that designate certain expertise over how you treat the data. So who can have access to the data, what can you release from it, uh, and how can we construct this co collective narrative is, is delineated. But it, there's also some democratic deliberation. You don't like the gender classification on the census, you lobby Statistics Canada to change it. In fact, they recently have changed it, right, for the 2021 census. I hope you all filled out your censuses. Um, but, you know, so you have this different mode of deliberation, and I think there's, uh, that's a bigger conversation that, you know, what is the assumption of, of what you're collecting a priori going into it and then uh, through analysis, through classification, because you know governments also engage in, in classification systems, uh, what are you bringing out of that that impacts our collective understandings? Absolutely, right? And humans are very messy and don't kind of fit into these neat boxes all the time. And so when we're creating data to make sense of that, what gets, who gets left out and who gets marginalized in those, in those uh, categorizations? Or whose life story gets told. Who, who built it is always the thing I want to ask. Who made that? AI doesn't exist outside of time and space. So it's, that means it's political and cultural. And so um, no matter what we call it or what the concept is, and I totally understand that we may not call it the same thing anymore. And I think that's good. We should probably name the thing and what it does, not the vague notion that's based on a biological body, intelligence. So to me, I, I think we have to ask who built that. And what were the expectations of those people? What do they think we're supposed, that knowledge is supposed to be like? 
So, you know, and so mm -hmm. I'm an identity theorist. One of the things that I often do is go back to John Locke, who lived a long time ago in the 17th century. One of the things John Locke, it was a time of great upheaval, very much like our own. And one of the things he did was he invented the term identity, which meant both sameness, but also property. And unfortunately, we confuse the two things all the time when we talk. So identity theft means yourself can be stolen if you are data, right? That's what it actually means. But he didn't differentiate between consciousness and ownership. And now look at us, right? I'm sure Nicole would have something to say about that in labor, right? <laughs> yeah. And so if we think, who made this thing? What were their expectations? And can we change them? To me, that's really important when we think through what our relationship is to this stuff. So mm. um, throw it out to you guys. I can just jump in. I'm just thinking about something yeah. that I'm working on at the moment with um, it's a choreographer based in Montreal called Isabel Van Grimm. We're working on a project about AI. Um, and one of the things I'm kind of playing with is metahumans. Anybody know about metahumans? You can make this incredible, incredibly realistic avatar of yourself. The idea being that when we can't live in this world, we go, oh, we're going to be living in the metaverse. And it's so powerful and so realistic, but very uncanny. But there's a compulsion to do it. We want to see ourselves in these spaces. And it's exciting and it's thrilling to do it. So there's, I guess there's kind of like an ego that is pushing us towards making them. We're also synthesizing her voice. Like It's just incredible how much can be done. Um, and these copies that we all make of ourselves, again, it's going back to Hans Moravec, like down, how do you download your consciousness to the datascape? But why do we want to do it? We want to see ourselves is the, I guess, the narcissist, huh? We're already there. So why do we want to see ourselves? Yeah. We want to live forever, maybe. I don't, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I can do that. But that's what makes us human, we're going to die, so. But our meta-humans will live on. Unless the servers get destroyed. Yes, unless the, yeah, by a forest fire. <laughs> okay, I think we'll move on to question number three. So what continued um, role does, uh, yes, this is where we are. What continued role does AI play in shaping cultural norms and expectations? And how might this impact our sense of identity? Okay, I'll take this from, because uh, Julie was mentioning labor. So I, I mean, I think of AI, essentially in the context of the human history of tools, right? So tools change everything. They expand our human capacities, whether it's a stone ax, whether it's an earth moving machine, whether it's an AI, this is fundamentally changing what we're capable of. And that's really exciting, but it also fundamentally changes how work is organized and how we relate to each other through what we do at, at work. Um, and at that point you would say, okay, well, do tools define what they do? Do they define their own use? And as a sociologist, my answer is, of course, no, right? People do. People uh, decide how we use tools. They set up divisions of labor. They set up factories and physical virtual spaces. Um, and they decide which technologies to sort of prioritize, right? We build environments that allow certain tools to thrive and, and other tools to fail, right? And we can think of lots of, of technological failures, kind of a fun activity to do. But, you know, nothing's inevitable. And, and how how we are going to arrange that is going to fundamentally reshape our identities. And I think the concern for, for work, I, I think Marilyn has lots of fun examples or thought experiments for, for artists, but how AI has been implemented in workplaces has been pretty patterned, right? It's used as a selection tool to hire people or fire people. It's used as a way to manage workers. So we collect data on people's abilities or performance uh, and use that as a way to promote people or select talent, but also to, to sort of fire people, right? So how that gets set up uh, is, is a major point of concern because it's going to lock in potentials, right? Or it's going to prohibit other potentials. And I think this is where we, we start seeing uh, uh, discussions, like we need to have big conversations about how we're going to use these technologies and what decisions, uh, what long-term impacts those decisions are going to make. So what does it mean for identity? Well, if you use a hiring tool that is trained on historical or biased data, you select a certain type of worker, that 
seems potentially like inevitably the cultural form of the worker that does that type of work. And you're locked into choosing that type of worker. Uh, and you can see that with, with gendered work relations in, in human history, right? We have women's work and men's work. Um, and so to what extent do our systems perpetuate or lock in those associations? Uh, and that's a big, big question. I'd just like to jump in a little bit with, because um, something that's been coming up as you're talking about labor is this idea of like de-skilling certain forms of labor, because that's something that's very topical in um, creative industries right now. Uh, the, and uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you had thoughts on this idea of uh, like contemporary generative technologies, for example, and the way they're kind of looming to, to de-skill certain forms of labor, not because their output is as good, but because it's faster and cheaper. I mean, I don't have a big statement to say on that other than, you know, I think people use technologies to displace labor, to cheapen uh, the work process, right? You can see that, I mean, Charles Babbage, like go back to Charles Babbage and then Adam Smith and, you know, the, the de-skilling and detailed division of labor is a way to, uh, to save money, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. And it has implications for how we do work, how skill is expressed, and I think there's big questions about who we think is automatable. You know, why is it that we had this idea that abstract knowledge was not automatable? You know, if we can uh, automate manual labor, why not uh, automate everything? Um, and that's a question about power. Yeah. So I, I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just thinking about right now the, the writer strike that's going on in the United States and the potential Screen Actors Guild uh, thing that's going on. And one of the major topics of those conversations is the use of, say, generative AI tools in screenwriting and the worry that um, writers are going to be de-skilled to editing the outputs of generative tools, not because those tools are better, but because it's a way to pay writers less to, to do that kind of work. And when we think about generative tools and the kind of scope of data that they're collecting and working with, there's this kind of flattening or homogenization that happens with all of that kind of stuff as well, so. I mean, AI is good at basic tasks. Like I'm gonna, I need to cook a meal. I have three ingredients. I'm sick of what I know how to make. I should ask my AI helpful person thing, whatever it is. And I say, what can I do with this macaroni, cheese, and uh, mustard? What do I do with that? And maybe they'll tell me I could make something. But if I were a chef, could I do that? And the answer is no, probably not. You wouldn't want to ask AI to do it for you. You might ask for advice. So why can't that happen with writing? Hmm. Why, is, why do we imagine um, things like ChatGPT taking over as opposed to assisting? And that, that I don't, you know, because writers do think something's better, more unexpected stuff is better, and uh, network television is dying because it's so predictable. So to me, I think, like, you know, we don't have to have AI be in charge. So I'm, you know, just, I'm wondering what you guys think about that for labor. I think, I think that ties into the, the idea of de-skilling, though. Uh, it, not that... Um, because that's, that seems to be like the trend that's happening now with the tools as they are being deployed is not necessarily in an assistive capacity, but as a way to um, cheapen certain kinds of labor value, or at least that, that seems to be how they're, they're hitting the market currently. Fordist economics cheapens labor value too. So the production, the, the advent of production lines already turn people into machines. And as mm -hmm. Nicole is saying, we didn't do that with mines. Funny how that ha didn't happen, <laughs> because folks in charge don't want to be replaced. But I just think, if you're already in a situation where you're automating people's bodies, is that a good thing, then, to not just leave that to machines? You're already automating people's bodies. So what I'm, I'm not saying, like, don't, you know, I'm not saying we should just get rid of writers or something. That's ridiculous. But what I mean is, it's not necessarily better to keep people doing factory floor jobs that are dehumanizing and evil or dangerous. And so could AI do some things like that, even mental tasks, that we don't need to be doing so that we can do things that are better than what we're doing right now? I wonder what happens 
in the next generations as we, you know, autom uh, you know automate, uh, let's say, education or the use of chat PAT, GP, uh, GPT be and great. those, right? And so where, you know, essays are being written and, and what so and what not and what happens as we lose those critical thinking skills or we're just, you know, editing or perusing what the AI came up with and just the implications into the future, yeah. I'll leave it to my younger colleagues. I think that's <laughs> hilarious. I think that means that we're not teaching writing properly if we're teaching people to replicate things. Mm -hmm. I, think I think we should be better at it. Do we have a question from the audience? Do we want to yeah. take an audience question? Come on, audience. I'm very sorry for the interruption. Can you please use the microphone so our online audience can hear the question? Uh, hello. So basically, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is about like ChatGPT. So as we all know that ChatGPT could just uh, provide some kind of intelligent feedback to like people based on some kind of large language model. Uh, but uh, there are some kind of like problem with the pro like data privacy of ChatGPT. Is that sometimes like the answer of ChatGPT might include some kind of personal information, mm -hmm. and I know that OpenAI is trying their best to avoid this kind of problem from happening. And another problem is like uh, so for ChatGPT. You know, a lot of people are just uh, using it to write essays. Uh, for example, the undergraduate student and graduate student, uh, they are using it to like uh, finish their own essay. So actually, what if there are some kind of like uh, papers or some kind of research papers inside the data set of the chat GPT? Uh, and if they are just providing those kind of data without citation, that would be some kind of uh, breach of academic integrity. So I think this could lead to some kind of serious issue uh, because the data privacy and academic integrity, uh, integrity will be breached uh, by uh, training the AI, of training the ChatGPT on some kind of unauthorized data set. So how can we ensure the data privacy of ChatGPT? Have your data collection as opt-in rather than opt-out? I mean, yeah. the, the whole model was basically that everything is up for grabs, right? And it seems like that's the general approach to building data, data sets, is to grab absolutely everything that you can. And, you know, like these tools are designed on an, on an everything that you can get is okay to use unless there is a reason not to. And it really needs to start from the reverse position, I think, where uh, the data set is constructed through conspicuous opt-in rather than opt-out. Um, I think, and because doesn't that sound like colonialism? Every, you know, trying to grab as much as possible. Like, we don't want to do that. <laughs> but I think your question about essays is really good. So first of all, we already automate some things to do with essays. So one of the things I do, because I'm an English prof, okay? So one of the things I do is I teach my students how to use Zotero, which is a citation management software system. So it does, it automates some tasks that you don't need to do yourself. So that's great, right? Or spell check, that's great. But predictive, predictive text can be, have hilarious results, as we all know. And so to me, I think, um, I don't, I'm not actually, I'm in the minority in my area of the university, but I don't think chat GPT is a big problem. I think it means that we need to design what we do with writing better. Chat GPT can't go to the gym for you. <laughs> you know, you could send it to the gym, you know, it would tell you it went, but it would be like, you would still look like, you would still have no muscle tone. So to me, writing is like that. You have to do it yourself. Having said that, um, you might want to check with ChatGPT when you're writing to be able to see if something's good, but a lot of hilarious results come from ChatGPT having no context. And you're quite right, privacy law is different in every place in the world. And will something like that understand that there are national boundaries? No, not unless there's opt-in.
So I have to say, we have to set the limits as human beings. For once, for once, I agree with Elon Musk, the only time. It's yeah. on record. <laughs> Hi, Elon. I don't agree with you about anything else. I see. Yeah, sometimes ChatGPT will provide some kind of hilarious text, maybe like without source. But actually, I know that I cannot totally depend on it to write my own essay. Yeah. Uh, and the second question is like, there are several schools in China, basically, they are trying to let the student to wear some kind of headset. And by using this kind of headset and some kind of AI automatic tracking system, they can uh, like show or track whether this student is uh, paying attention to the class or not. But I think this kind of technology is a serious breach of the personal <laughs> privacy because mind yeah. is a personal property that cannot be visualized or being tracked by some kind of AI system. So how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, that's really shocking. Um, and it's an example of like how we need to understand what the data we're producing is and why it's being produced and how it can be used by others and to be able to be able to say like to not be able to do it. Um, the problem with many of our system, let's say like Google, we kind of have to use all of these apps like I couldn't work if I didn't use my Google suite. But I know that a lot of the data that I'm putting in there is being used. Um, as data to feed machine learning and AI processes, we don't have the choice. It has to become a political issue, and there has to be legislation. And we're seeing this swell now coming. Yeah. People are saying this has to change. We need to be. Fo this is a, must be a major focus yeah. for us. Data sovereignty. Yeah. And also just basic respect for human rights. I think is something that should always foreground those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's another question next to you. Hi. Um, so I think it's a fundamental question. Um, you know, our genetics evolved over two and a half million years, primarily in a hunter-gatherer environment in a tribal unit. Uh, and then the agricultural revolution, urbanization, monetization changed everything, industrialization. Um, and now the current generation, without looking back, is really disconnected. And there's a mismatch between our modern lifestyle, diet, and and our fundamental drive. Um, so I'm thinking AI is just going to disconnect us and be more of a mismatch from our genetic program and our behavior and everything else and how we're screwing up the world with overpopulation, pollution, et cetera. So we're just gonna get further, further away. Um, so I think we're programmed to accumulate because the businessmen of today, of today or the hunters of yesterday, they hunted for the tribe. They didn't just accumulate for the purpose of accumulation. So don't you think this is just gonna get worse and worse and we're gonna you know, really screw everything up? Because our homeostasis is in that tribal form rather than, and, and we're seeking tribe now and companies and everything else we do, we're just getting further and further away from the essence and the purpose of our program. I mean, I think that's, it depends on what you think it means to be human. So, right, you're offering a conception of humanness rooted in that particular historical moment, which we're really far away from it at this point, um, post-industrial revolution. I'm not sure it's, you know, the way to say, oh, we just need to go back to an earlier time and that's going to solve uh, all of our social problems or technological problems or climate um, problems that we're currently living through. So um, I, I'm not going to kind of make a bold statement in response to that, what we need to do. I think we do need to have uh, an understanding of what we think it means to be human, right? And I think how we think AI is going to impact our chances as, as a species or, or where we go from there uh, is totally... Uh, grounded in what you think it means to be human. And, you know, if you're a theologian or a religious studies scholar, you know, your humanness is because you are animated by a soul. Uh, if you th are, are rooted in this idea of hunting and gathering, it's your ability to chase an animal uh, and to uh, provide for your, your tribe. If you're uh, a sociologist of work, I'll bring it back to that, you know, humanness is defined by your ability to consciously, creatively enact uh, in the world and enter into relationships relationships to produce, um, unlike other animals, which are supposedly driven by instinct alone. So um, like I said, I'm not going to make a big uh, pronouncement there, but I think we need to question our assumptions about what it means to be human and, and what we prioritize. Yeah. Um, my question 
uh, is for Danielle. I'm here. Can't see. Oh, it's, it's, sorry, we can't see. Very bright up here. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, humans have always had a relationship with tools. So any advancement in technology, anything invented, is kind of considered as a tool. But I'm wondering, is AI really a tool? And even if it is, how does it compare to other tools? Because when I think about previous you know, technological tools, kind of mechanical, they might be stronger than us, but I don't think they are way smarter. And you know, the smart applications and phones, we have always had people that know exactly what's going on and why. But if I take an AI model, right, a deep learning model, I know the beginning, I know the end, but I don't know what's in between. So even for the specialists themselves, it's still kind of a black box. So is really the relationship between like humans and AI a tool or it's kind of a special of a kind as a tool because it's also scary, impressive, but also we still don't know what is it really exactly. Well, I think humans have used tools that they don't understand how they work for a long time, right? Or you don't know the constituent parts or, or how matter relates to them, right? That we use things that uh, are put to, to, to use and they have use cases. And I'm not sure, I think in this case, it's really important to understand what the models are doing. And I think that is a big question that relates to privacy and, and ethics. Um, I thought about this a lot too, you know, is AI a tool? Is AI an assemblage of tools? Is AI a factory? Um, I think there's lots of different metaphors that you, but it depends on what exactly you're talking about. And uh, I, I don't think I have a better answer than that other than to sort of question um, our need to understand why we need to understand why it's a tool for us and, and how that relates to bigger eth ethical uh, issues. Hi, um, sorry, I'm over here. Uh, thank you so much for this panel. It was really interesting. Um, I had kind of a question about these meta humans and online digital selves. Um, so the first kind of the question is, we already know, for example, these big movie production companies, when they hire actors, um, will you know, take their voice data and take scans of them in case, for example, I don't know, something were to happen or they need posthumous um, data or they want to make a sequel in the future. Um, so we already have kind of that area, but then on the other hand, now we have the, these instances of non-consensual online selves. So for example, um, deep faked porn. So how do you think we can deal with um, these kind of online extensions of ourselves that perhaps we didn't agree to or we didn't create? So in the case of these actors, they're not actually acting in these lines, it's replicates of themselves. And then even for the everyday person, they can have these online replicates of themselves that they didn't agree to. Um, and so what do you think about that? You start, but like there's lots to say about that is That is like one of the biggest questions about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I'm just gonna jump in here because like that's one of the things that's currently um, at stake in the Screen Actors Guild, for example, is to what extent those tools are being used. And there's some companies like Disney has been notorious for doing that to basically everybody they work with. Mm -hmm. And there's a very real danger, and I think it's one that actors and particularly voice actors are starting to realize that um, they need to have some bargaining power over how these tools are used. Um, you see, one of the, the first things that comes to mind is actually from the, uh, a modding community for video games who will train um, like deep fake voices of actors who are already doing voice work in games in order to voice lines of dialogue in fan made mods for example and there's like ethical questions about that. So I think it's one where um, creatives like actors like writers uh, need to be advocating for clear guidelines around the regulation deployment and use of these tools and to actually have some bargaining power to do something about that. Yeah. We already have well-developed ethical systems to deal with when people die. And so, you know, like there are different kinds of societies that have said, this is how we bury people, this is what we do, this is what you shouldn't do, right? We have those things already. So I think in line with what you just said, we should have the same thing for our images. Um, privacy law was invented in the United States because Fatty Arbuckle, who was a comedian who was in silent films, died while he was having sex with a woman at a party. And his image was reproduced without his permission. 
um, around this scandal. And he went to court, and that's the beginning of privacy law, where there were decisions made that Fatty Arbuckle didn't just own his body, he owned his images. He owned all the subsequent images. And to me, that means that we should do the same for that. We should be able to say that those are us also in the future. What do you think? Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Marilyn. I, yeah, I agree. People need to be suing for, for this. We need to, cases. Law needs to be created in order to stop this being allowed to happen. Um, so it kind of t the problem is that it, we're behind. It's so slow. AI is so fast. It's faster than we can. We just can't keep up. We can't even understand it. But um, definitely in education, making sure that children understand how these systems work. Like we don't really, really understand how they work. We need to be training our children to understand yeah. that, and then we need to start legislating when it's being used incorrectly. Same with ChatGPT and. Yeah. Thank you, it's a great question. Thank you. So unfortunately we're running out of time, so I just wanted to thank our panelists for this stimulating and excellent conversation and uh, hopefully y'all can stay around a little bit and chat as well. So, um, so thank you all for coming and uh, take care.